Hello. 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 Good evening. Welcome to the second of this semester's Baumer Lectures, one that we are particularly excited about. I'm John Davis, an assistant professor in landscape, for those of you who don't know me. This semester, the committee set the theme of future geographies, bringing together speakers to talk about the variety of ways the design disciplines interact with wider and wider geographies, communities of labor, technology, human, non-human sociability, and, increasingly, and the increasingly unignorable facts of climate change. It's not often that I get to stay up late at night playing a computer game for work. Finishing the stunning and atmospheric game Norco last night has been one of the perks of this particular service assignment. The game, with its point-and-click adventure interface and moody, pixelated tableau, at first brought me back to certain episodes of a misspent youth. As I move through the storyline, you arrive home to a town in the lower reaches of the Mississippi, in the shadow of a sprawling refinery complex. You begin to sort the affairs of your recently passed mother and begin to search for your mysteriously absent brother. I became absorbed in this at once profoundly strange and also eerily familiar world. I wandered through New Orleans and its industrialized swamp suburbs. I met a pirate and a horse on the Batcher a strange cult in an abandoned mall, a refinery patrolled by android guards, a man lurking in a drainage ditch whose presence became both more and more comical and more and more menacing as the game went on. And close to the end, I had an unexpected experience. Without giving, too many, giving away too many spoilers, I want to describe it. Near the game's climax, you move through a dream world of the architectural floor plan of the house the main character grew up in. You walk from room to room as the floodwaters rise, a final inundation of your neighborhood and life brought about by that looming refinery nearby. You splash from room to room, water rising slowly from your ankle to your knee, speaking to members of your family, exchanging regrets and farewells as the house begins to disintegrate and wash away in a final deluge. The sense of loss conveyed on multiple levels was poignant and moving. This was very, very different from the feelings I felt when I used to play Mario Kart. I think it would be cliche to make a statement to the effect that video games have matured and become an art form of their own. I think most of us would accept that. Instead, I want to think more about the limits of the media and representations we use in architecture schools and the willingness or unwillingness among us to boldly wade into how anarchic our environments really are, how funny or terrifying or mystifying our cities and landscapes can be, both, and both the futility and exhilaration that comes from trying to work with ecologies and social systems that defy capture by precise instruments of our discipline. Fortunately, we have a tremendous artist here with us tonight to think with. Yutz, our speaker tonight, is to my knowledge the only pseudonymous uh, bomber speaker in the history of our series, and certainly one of our more mysterious. He is a member of the game collective Geography of Robots, whose recently released title Norco won the inaugural Tribeca Film Festival Award in the video game category. He is an artist, writer, and geographer, and holds an urban studies degree and a master's degree in city and regional planning from the University of New Orleans. He joins us tonight having driven up, driven up the Mississippi, Ohio, and Scioto and that route is a little bit more figural than literal, I've just learned, um, <clears throat> from his home downstream from us in New Orleans. Please join me in welcoming him to Knowlton tonight. Cool. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, can y'all hear me? Cool. Yeah, John, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. I wasn't expecting this, but it's really cool, and I appreciate it. Um, thank you to the Knowlton School for having me. Thank you, John, for telling me how to pronounce Knowlton. I was, I was going to get up here and say Knowlton, and I would have, <laughs> would have had to run out of the fire exit uh, in shame. But 
Yeah, so Norco um, is our first title. I work with a studio called Geography of Robots. We are sort of a small collaborative that came together specifically to finish this game. And it's based on and inspired by a real town in South Louisiana, a community called Norco, Louisiana. It's where I grew up. Um, I've been studying it. I've been interested in it <clears throat> since I was really young. It, the industrial landscape left an impact on me from a young age. And so I went on to study it, like he said, at the University of New Orleans. I wrote my thesis on the ways that uh, petrochemical industrialization influences land use patterns up and down the Mississippi River <clears throat> between Baton Rouge and New Orleans which is referred to as the River Parish region, but you may have also heard it called Cancer Alley or even Death Alley. And that, um, I've moved through various projects researching this community and it always takes different forms. So some of them are a little more informal and the game was an outgrowth of various experiments. Um, and it started as a small project. I, I never intended to, you know, I don't know if y'all are familiar with itch.io. I intended to put it up on a small uh, game distribution platform, really informal, and put it up there for free and be done with it. But along the way, a publisher, Ralph Yuri, got interested, and one thing led to another, and the game consumed my life. Um, and so, yeah, now I'm here. But to give you an idea of, or actually, I should probably go over what I'm going to go over before I start, but I'd like to cover tonight the <clears throat> two, two things specifically, which is the way in which industry influences urban land uses along the Mississippi River and the way that that informs the landscapes that are featured in the game, and also wetland ecology in South Louisiana, specifically hurricanes and coastal erosion, and the ways in which that plays into the the, both the narrative and the game mechanics of Norco. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of what the game is like, um, has anyone in here played Snatcher by Hideo Kojima? Yeah, I, not, not many, but okay, you have, cool, yeah. And then maybe Deja Vu, NES game. Yeah, okay, these are, these are some old point and click games that inspired Norco, and there's a few other ones, but these games are first-person, point-of-view, pixel art, noir, interactive games. They're very narrative-heavy, a lot of dialogue. Um, a more maybe contemporary example, I'm, I'm not sure who's familiar with Kentucky Route Zero, but that's a narrative game that's similar in certain ways because they share elements of Southern Gothic and some other things. So, And then if people haven't heard of any of those games, I'll say it's, it's like Mist, but with a lot of reading. And that, that sometimes gets the idea across, but it's illustrated using pixel art, which for those who aren't familiar, pixel art is a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of iconic games were illustrated using pixel art. You're using small squares. A lot of times you're using very limited color palettes and you're using uh, lim limited uh, canvas sizes as well. So you've got really low resolution art that you're working with. And people, use terms like retro to describe it or think of it as kind of an anachronistic medium, but it's actually a very vibrant uh, and active medium online. There's a big community of pixel artists who are always pushing the medium forward. And it was interesting to me because I was attracted to the limitations because it provides almost a, a more tactile way of making art in, you know, in online or in the virtual space. And I found that interesting, but so yeah, these are some screenshots from the game showing some environments. You click around, you interact with dialogue. There's many games. If you've played a traditional point-and-click adventure, you will have some familiarity with the mechanics here. <clears throat> and I worked with another artist, Jesse Jacoby, who actually uh, hand-painted. He's a traditional painter, and he hand-painted the key art for the game here. But we worked together um, to develop a more painterly style for the pixel art that's featured in the game. And this piece right here, it's a little dark on that screen, so it's probably kind of hard to make out. Um, and I do apologize. Oh, thank you. Take a sip. 
I apologize if the quality of um, some of these slides is uh, low quality. A few of them are pretty low resolution. And so this is a pixelated illustration of satellite imagery of the greater New Orleans area. And there's, <clears throat> at the center of it, you can see downtown New Orleans. It's the most brightly illuminated. There's a black line that snakes through the metropolitan area. That's the Mississippi River. And if you look to the left, then you're looking also to the west, and you're looking upriver towards Baton Rouge. And the strip of urbanization that runs along the Mississippi River, if you can make that out, is the River Parish region. Norco is pretty much in the middle of it. And this is where the game centers all of its narrative, um, with the exception of a few minor details. And the River Parish region itself <clears throat> is very heavily industrialized. There's a high concentration of petrochemical facilities along the river. All those red dots are, uh, are industrial facilities. And there are a few reasons that this is the case. Uh, obviously, the Gulf of Mexico is nearby, so there's oil reserves just downriver. The river gets used for coolant for some of these facilities. It gets used to dump affluent. And also, most importantly, for what I'd be, I'll be discussing tonight is that the, mis the strip of land along the Mississippi River is the natural levee of the, of the Mississippi. So you may be familiar with river geomorphology in that the river swells, it deposits sediment along its banks, and then it recedes. And over the years, that sediment deposition becomes broad natural levees. And those are the highest ground areas often. That's the 500-year floodplain, according to FEMA, the most secure, least flood-prone geography in southeast Louisiana. And that is where a lot of these industries are located along uh, these natural levees. <clears throat> this creates some conflicts. Yeah, this is one of those slides. I pulled this from an old slideshow. It's like a little busted looking, but hopefully you can make it out. It's, um, you can see Norco next to the Shell Motiva refinery. And across from the Shell Motiva refinery, the, the red polygons are uh, industrial facilities. Across from the Shell Motiva refinery is the sh Shell's chemical annex. So Norco itself is wedged between two very large industrial facilities. <clears throat> and so, what, you, what occurs is that you have a, co a conflict between residential and commercial land uses and industrial land uses. And a lot of times, this will lead directly to the displacement of residential communities, which I'll detail in just a bit. But this is another. So a friend of mine actually has a Cessna airplane, and he took me for a ride above Norco one time, and a lot of the imagery that I'd captured during this plane ride actually used as reference material for the game. Um, but so this is Norco. Just to give you a sense of the industrial scale, you're looking at the Shell Motiva facility from downriver, and you can see the trees beyond the facility. You're looking towards uh, Baton Rouge, and those, that tree line, there's some residences in it, that's Norco. And so you can see just how much Norco, the residential area, is dwarfed by the refinery. Um, this is a depiction of it. Uh, and something I regret about the game is that I didn't really capture the scale as accurately as I could have. But <clears throat> in the game, there is a refinery called Shield, um, in, inspired by Shell, uh, that is bounded in green in the game. And then to the, to the left or upriver are, uh, the, is the residential community of Norco. So that's the way this, this industrial geography is depicted in the game. This is another one. Um, this was taken not too far from my parents' house. They live pretty close to the fence line. 
and it's a drone shot, and you can see, again, you can see the, um, how much the neighborhood is dwarfed by the refinery. This is another one I was in my friend's, my friend Ricky <laughs> flew me around, and it just happened to be a day where there was massive flaring, and I'd captured this picture, so that's another one where you can just get a sense of, you know, the, the, the negative externalities and the disamenities of these facilities. There's constant flaring, um, a lot of emission, periodic explosions, which I'll discuss, and there's another one, and then this is another one just to give you a different perspective on the refinery. So for anyone who's visited Louisiana, you may have driven along Interstate 10 over the Bonnie Carey Spillway, over Lake Pontchartrain, and you'll notice a, a continuous industrial skyline. If you're going towards Baton Rouge, you'll look off to your left, and there's a wide open marsh in Lake Pontchartrain, and then beyond that is this, this skyline. And that skyline's Norco. And some people mistake it for New Orleans, actually, when they're driving uh, in this area, people who aren't too familiar with the region. <clears throat> okay, so residential displacement is a, is a byproduct of uh, these facilities locating along the Mississippi River. This is one case, this may be a little difficult to make out, but you've got the three panels up top, these are old USGS maps, 1952, 1967, 1992. There are these red polygons. And you can see that the residential parcels are disappearing from this boundary until finally you have what's the imagery that's available today on Google Maps where the refinery has completely scared, you know, scabbed over this area. And so what happens in most cases, and this is a, uh, area, my, my grandma actually grew up here. This is a neighborhood called Good Hope. In a lot of these cases, what happens is that people live there before the refineries. Um, in many cases, it is um, formerly enslaved people who continue to work along plantation lands or at, you know, on the plantation lands. <clears throat> and they reside there along the Mississippi River. The refineries move in, the plantation lands cheap and plentiful, and so they buy it up, and these existing residential communities end up having an, you know, unwittingly having an industrial neighbor that presents all of these disamenities, and then the residential area will fight and campaign for relocation or a buyout because living next to it's dangerous, it's noxious, what have you. <clears throat> This is a map of maybe some of you are familiar with Diamond, Louisiana. In terms of environmental justice communities, it's a fairly high profile one. Diamond is in Norco. Um, so what you're looking at here is there are these yellow parcels that are next. They run along the boundary to the right, purple boundary, Shell Motiva facility, and then to the left, the Shell Chemical Facility, and then you have a large concentration of, of parcels there. That's the Diamond community. <clears throat> they campaigned for a buyout for a long time um, and finally got some support from larger NGOs. They put a lot of pressure on Shell. Shell agreed to purchase properties, <clears throat> and the, the community re relocated. That happens. The buyout began in 2002, and I believe it lasted until 2004. So this is an event that is fictionalized in the game as well. And this gives you another perspective of that area. This is just, I just grabbed this off of Google. But the large facility to the left is the Shell Chemical facility. And just to the right of it is a stripped strip of uh, undeveloped land that became buffer land after they purchased diamonds and it's vacant now. But this is a way, this is one of the ways in which these industrial facilities dominate the high ground natural levee of the Mississippi River is they displace other land uses. And when you move further away from the natural levee, you're moving into more low-lying areas, into the swamps, 
towards the marsh into more flood prone areas. And so the net effect is that industry gains more land that is secure and flood resistant, whereas other land uses become less flood resistant. <clears throat> and this is a pixel illustration of Dimes, uh, a community in the game that was inspired by diamonds. It is, there is a resident, the last resident who lives in Dimes after the buyout occurred, and he stays there um, despite the buyout. He, he rejects the buyout and he stays there anyway, and this is in part inspired by uh, something that occurred in southwest Louisiana in a community called Mossville. There's a documentary about it that I recommend, and I, I list it. I list some resources at the end of this, and I have it listed there. But I rec recommend everyone watch it. <clears throat> in 1988, there was a large explosion in Norco. A catalytic cracking unit had a what what people speculate happened anyway. It was a pipe elbow, a rusty pipe elbow, in the catalytic cracking unit within a confined chamber. It rusted gas emitted into this chamber, it became pressurized, and somehow there was a spark, it exploded, it sent a shock wave 25 miles in all directions, it blew out windows as far away as New Orleans. Norco is 20 or so river miles upriver from New Orleans. Massive shock wave, it blew out all the windows in my family's house. Um, I was a baby at the time. There was a curtain hanging over the window. My crib was beneath the window. The glass hit the uh, curtain, apparently, according to my parents. And the glass rained down, and I slept through it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that, that's the story, anyway. My mom thought I was dead. She walks in, she gets the glass off of me. We evacuate to my grandma's house in Laplace, uh, just up Airline Highway from Norco. Um, so this event is also fictionalized in the game, Norco. And I should say this was also, this added a lot of um, ballast to the Diamond Community's campaign um, because it's so, it became so evident to so many people just how dangerous these facilities could be. <clears throat> so this is a pixel illustration of an event similar to the 1988 explosion that gets discussed in the game. You've got a catalytic cracking unit, which uh, Jesse Jacoby, who I mentioned, actually illustrated the one on the left, and then I illustrated the one in the center of the explosion, and one of the protagonists of the game, her husband died in the explosion, and she narrates the event in the game. I'd said earlier that I had been exploring a lot of these concepts in various ways, just through different projects. This is a photo from one of them, which is me and a friend of mine after Katrina were driving around Louisiana, interviewing people, doing some archival research, and writing small articles and things like that, and just trying to explore in a nebulous way the intersection of various extractive industries in Louisiana. So that was kind of the first attempt um, to seriously explore these ideas creatively. There's a photo where we projected, we went to the pine woods in southwest Louisiana and we projected footage of flaring in Norco onto an old couch. I don't, I don't even know why we did this, but this is something we ended up doing. And, um, and then I made an interactive map um, for a while. It's not online anymore, but it's, it explores a lot of these histories as well of the River Parish region. And yeah, does anyone recognize this picture? This is, uh, this is Midgar um, in, from Final Fantasy VII, yeah. And my, the idea to make a game to communicate these, uh, communicate these concepts uh, came, I'd already, I'd already been thinking about it for a while because after playing this game, Final Fantasy VII explores some environmental justice 
themes in the game because you have an extractive industry, an extractive facility, and there are communities that live literally beneath the facility that resemble fence line communities in South Louisiana. And so that had been bouncing around in my head since I was a teenager. And so I, I started trying to apply these themes to a video game. My first attempt was uh, a JavaScript like browser game. Um, that was just a side scroller, and this, these are some like early mock-up shots. It was pretty boring. Um, you know, I'm not that interested, or I wasn't at the time anyway. I'm getting more into it, but designing platformer physics, it was just too tedious. Whereas I, I was hoping to tell a story in a more narrative way about Norco, but I was trying to make the protagonist. It followed a protagonist named Million, who is also a character in the current. Uh, iteration of Norco, but she would turn into this little Metroid ball and she could shoot drones and do all this stuff, but I was getting so lost in the physics of it, so I decided to um, to move to create a point and click adventure instead, which is what we have today. And this is a illustration fr from the game. This is of the wooded area that runs along the flood bank of the Mississippi River, and this is an image that my sister shot of that same area. Oh, I forgot that was right there. Um, let's see, what do we got next? Yeah, so I mentioned wetland ecology. And <clears throat> the wetlands on the west side of Lake Pontchartrain, outside of New Orleans, near Norco, play a major part in the narrative of the game. And they, there's an exploration of a hurricane the unnamed hurricane of 1915 in the game that gets discussed. The, the timeline in the game is a little bit obscure. The years in the game are encoded, so you can't tell exactly what year everything's happening, but really canonically, the game takes place in the alternative 2017, 2018, so it's more of a near, near past with a sci-fi veneer, but so, there's a discussion of this unnamed hurricane of 1915 that cut through uh, Western Lake Pontchartrain and destroyed two communities, La Branche and Frenier. And I actually have a video that I wanted to show y'all of this event that'll give you a little more context. So I'm gonna pull that up. It's like a four minute documentary thing. So I cannot hold a camcorder still. <laughs> I just can't do it. So if you're like, if you get nauseous easily or anything, um, just scroll Twitter or something, and <laughs> you can just listen. But so what this is is a uh, it's an interview with a family member who grew up in the River Parishes, and he describes his mom survived a storm, the 1915 unnamed hurricane. He describes her experience of it and what happens. And I had shot, I had interviewed him in, in 2012. Hurricane Isaac had just passed through Louisiana, and it destroyed Braithwaite, Louisiana, further downriver from New Orleans, and it also destroyed a neighborhood in Laplace, Louisiana, just upriver from Norco. And so I had shot a bunch of footage, like I said, just uh, messy camcorder footage, but I edited this footage over his description of the 1915 storm, and he raises some interesting parallels he talks about how the area that got destroyed was uninhabitable until subdivisions and urban sprawl began, began to creep into these areas, into these low-lying areas. And once that happened, they became flood-prone again. And so this ties a bit into the idea of urban patterns along the natural high ground of the Mississippi River versus them creeping into the more flood-prone areas beyond in the swamps. And so, I'll play this video real quick. Another thing you'll see at the end, um, there's a bunch of tombs, overturned tombs in Braithwaite that got scattered all along the road. You know, it picked up houses and it threw them on the man-made levee along the Mississippi River. It, tombs tumbled everywhere, tombs weren't covered. There's footage of that. And there's also just footage of environments in this area, both in Laplace and Braithwaite, that were destroyed by Hurricane Isaac in 2012. All right, so. All right, 
you want to say your name and where you're from just so I can adjust the level? All right. My name is Donald Tragg. It's Christmas Day, 2012. And I'd like to share some of the experiences I had growing up in St. John Parish as a young boy. To begin with, my mother always feared bad weather. Uh, every time she would hear high winds or lightning and thunder, she would have a, a fear that something bad was going to happen. I never understood why, but later in life, I found out that she survived a storm when she was only five years old, which actually came from across Lake Pontchartrain and onto the shores in St. John Parish. At that time, there was a settlement in a little town called Frenier. At any rate, uh, this little town of Frenier uh, was caught off guard not knowing that there was a hurricane coming. and uh, didn't bother to evacuate or prepare. So when the storm hit, it hit such a high surge of water coming from the lake that it swept all of the houses or camps or residents of the uh, 200 people who lived there into the swamp. And then the only survivors of that storm were those who were able to cling to a boxcar, which was stalled on the railroad tracks near the lake. Those that drowned were found scattered all over the swamp, some in trees that were 50 foot off the ground. So this tremendous surge of water that came through and hit St. John Parish, which had a water surge high enough to push water from the lake all the way up to the airline highway. Now, we didn't learn from that lesson because soon all of that land between the lake and the airline highway in St. John Parish was developed into subdivisions. There was also a settlement in St. Charles Parish called La Branch. There were about 200 German families who lived there and actually formed the uh, land between the lake and the uh, railroad track in St. Charles Parish. Well, again, they were unprepared too for this storm. And because most of that is wetlands, they didn't have any survivors from that storm. It killed about 200 people. And the town of La Branch was never again settled as a residential area. So that event is also explored in the game, and it's in the third act. The, the game gets a little, it kind of goes off the rails a little bit by the third act and gets a little surreal. Whoa. And let's see, my bad. But yeah, so it gets a little surreal, but you live essentially through a, a dreamlike experience um, of the 1915 storm. <clears throat> Another aspect of this region that gets explored in the game is coastal erosion, which maybe you're familiar with um, saltwater intrusion, getting into the freshwater and brackish water and destroying the root system of the cypress trees and the Spartina grass that holds the land together <clears throat> and this is caused by extraction pipeline canals um, 
boating can do it as well. There's a few different mechanisms for coastal erosion, but it happens, it's happened in the Norco area as a result of the construction of Interstate 10, which introduced a lot of salt water into Lake Pontchartrain, into an area of Lake Pontchartrain near where um, Donald Trigg was just discussing. And in the game, you have a map of, it's almost like a microcosm of Lake Pontchartrain, the Lake Pontchartrain area near New Orleans. And it brings together characteristics of the marshlands in far south Louisiana and Lake Maurepas, which is nearby. And one feature of it is what's called in the game ghost bayous, which you have these bayous that have become so eroded due to saltwater intrusion that you can no longer see the banks of the bayous. And this is a real phenomenon in the lake. And um, my dad and his friends, uh, my dad was a shrimper <clears throat> for a while, and he, him and his, and they would go recreational boating as well. And so the way that they dealt with this, because you have to navigate these bayous um, regardless of whether or not you can see the bank, because if you go over what was historically land before it was eroded, your prop is going to hit fallen cypress trees. So you have to know where the bayous are, even though you can't see them. And so they would sink pilings um, into the lake to mark where these bayous were. Uh, using concrete buckets, they would tie it to the piling, drive it down, go get the bucket, do it again. <clears throat> and this is a feature of the game as well. So you have to navigate through the historical footprint of these bayous, even though you can't see it. And so you go through kind of a dream logic in order to reveal these bayous. And so what's in green is the wetland that's visible, and then what's in red is not, not visible. There's also, I should mention, um, you have these spoken wheel patterns across this map, and those are cypress logging wheels that the way that cypress logging would occur is they would park a large boat at the center, and then they would send, they would dredge in, in linear patterns in a, in a spiral. So if you're flying into New Orleans and you look down over Lake Pontchartrain, you'll actually see these spiral patterns in the wetlands um, in Lake Pontchartrain, and those, those are where uh, cypress logging had happened. <clears throat> and so some other themes in the game, one that's critical, um, and John, you had mentioned it as well, is the dissolution of home, the disappearance of actual physical homes, and homes in Louisiana, as anywhere, are repositories of culture, cookbooks, photo, photo albums, things like that. And there's a lot of flooding. And you know, my my um, home flooded. You know, when I was younger, multiple times, we lost a lot of pictures and, and memorabilia and other things. And the cult, the consequence at a larger scale of this repeated flooding is something that's explored in the game. <clears throat> And just the way that the wetlands are eroding, that you have these cultural networks that are eroding. Um, if you're familiar with the Ile de Jean Charles tribe, they recently had to relocate from their ancestral island in South Louisiana as a result of coastal erosion. And so that's a very high profile case of this, this actual material concept of the dissolution of home in South Louisiana. And that is a theme that runs throughout the game as well. And then faith. Um, you know, I grew up Catholic and went to a Catholic school. The Catholic school was near um, an industrial facility, and the Catholic imagery and industrial imagery were pretty tightly coupled in my head growing up, and you see that intersection quite a bit in the game as well. And then also Mardi Gras and carnival season. The game, like I said, it takes place in this, this alternative um, late winter, early spring of 2018, and there are people dressed up for Mardi Gras uh, in, in the game. And there's you know various kinds of Mardi Gras crews in New Orleans. You've got the super crews. Um, and then you've got the more unconventional foot parades, and both have, there are nods to them in the game as well. 
and illness uh, is a theme of the game as well. One of the protagonists is, has metastatic cancer, and this is a diagram where there's a narrative part of the game where one of the characters is, is narrating the spread of illness through her body, and it gets uh, illustrated in this diagram. And then a last theme that I'll discuss briefly is, uh, is clouds and cloudscapes. Louisiana has gorgeous cloudscapes. Louisiana is also very, very flat. And so if you're looking for any kind of elevation, you usually look to the clouds. And that was something that I've done since I was a kid. And so there's a lot of different cloud formations uh, in the game. This is a little resource list that I put together of, if you're interested in any of these uh, themes or topics, these are some resources that I recommend. Diamond is a collection of interviews of residents in Diamond, Louisiana, uh, who, had, who had been displaced by, by Shell. And uh, Uneasy Alchemy follows that same story. Um, it's, a, it's a good piece of scholarship on that event. The Lakes of Pontchartrain, if you're interested in wetland ecology in the Norco area, I recommend that book. And then I already mentioned it, but Mossville, uh, di di directed by Alex Glostrom, is a very good film. Um, he also did a movie called Big Charity about Charity Hospital in New Orleans that, if you're interested in New Orleans history, I recommend as well. And then there are two organizations that are very active in the River Parish region helping fence line communities. There's the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. And there's also Rise St. James. I recommend researching them, donating to them, whatever you feel inspired to do. And then the game, if you're interested in it, you can go to norcogame.com. And that's all I got for y'all. Thanks. Yeah. Just ask really quickly how do you consider audience on um, like who would be the audience? Yeah. Um, I so when it first started out, it was a small personal project with that I was planning on sharing with close friends and nobody else. Um, it kind of snowballed slowly, and the project got away from me. And honestly, the audience consideration, I didn't, beyond telling the story in, in a way that felt uh, emotionally honest, I wasn't sure who the audience was going to be. And I'll say that I, since the game was released, I've learned more about game design, writing, all of the constituent pieces of the game since release than I had in the five years of development. So. I think I would have, I'd have a stronger idea of who the audience was today than I did. But, um, you know, it's found an audience in the indie game scene that exists online. And I know there are some people in Louisiana who enjoy it as well. I think my main original motivation when I started this five or so years ago was specifically to, to draw more attention to fence line communities, but in a way that people would feel naturally compelled to participate in. So, yeah. Thanks so much. This was really engaging. Appreciate it. Um, could you go back to talking a little bit about the comment? Um, you can tease that out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, were, you were setting up a relationship between narrative, which may be linear, mm -hmm. and a kind of timelessness yeah. Game that's really important to help understand generational cultural theater. Th that's right. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. The, the game, um, it, time becomes very nebulous and distorted in the game. And it also deals, I didn't talk about this, but there's a whole section of the game that deals with the internet and, and being always online and also how that intersects with faith and all of these other things. And we were making and finalizing the game during COVID when there was some time distortion going on in our personal lives. And so I think 
confusion about time <laughs> and time collapsing, a sense of time collapsing into kind of a permanent now was at the heart of the game. So there's some intentional temporal distortion happening across the game for that reason. I think in part just so that the game could serve as a kind of artifact of the COVID era in a way. No. Well, <laughs> I knew a little bit because I had written, we actually, I wrote a little script where you, it's a little function that you input a year and then it scrambles it into alphanumerics, but in a, you know, a predictable way. And I'd done that from when I first started the game. And part of that was because I wanted to pull in different elements of past and future into the game while I was making it, but I didn't Ha but I think it just served the purpose of, of sort of exploring the COVID brain fog. Um, you know, that was just circumstance. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I was just curious if there is a soundtrack or maybe like some sound design that ties into the game and the thing it does, or if there isn't, is that something that you would have to add something uh, special to maybe like how we could experience? Space or yeah, there, so there's two sound artists that worked on the game, Gugali I and FM Aura, um, two sound designers, and they actually recently released the soundtrack. So some friends of ours who are in a band called Thou, who are from South Louisiana, they actually released the soundtrack of the game as a split release LP that you can get. But the soundtrack's really good. I, I like it a lot. and they did a good job of capturing kind of the, the emotional resonance of the region in an interesting and creative way. So yeah, I recommend checking it out. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for the lecture and uh, excellent execution. It's very beautiful, it's very nice Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, so it seemed like, especially with the uh, first question, you took this from a personal place to talk about it and it evolved into a game. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of even how to answer it. I, so I think that games, you know, I was always hesitant to call this a game because it's, by some people's standards, not fun. <laughs> um, and so I, <laughs> I, you know, was resistant to it and I would use the term interactive media, but then I started to feel pretentious because I was largely moving through game spaces. Um, and so I was like, you know, presenting what was clearly a game inspired by games, calling it interactive media. I felt kind of like an asshole saying it, so I stopped saying it. And then, um, but people, like I've heard in the time since from all kinds of people I would never expect who really love the game and also have experienced similar things. People who have grown up in either industrialized communities across the world or who, who have had always had their own, the way that I talked about Final Fantasy VII, have, like through postmodern representations of disaster and in industry and all of these other things, they've drawn, drawn their own parallels by playing whatever games they were playing when they were growing up. So I think games do provide a way of a kind of, and I think because, and I know you mentioned the kind of like, uh, John, you mentioned the games as art discourse, and in a way I almost, in, now that I'm a little more, a little less tangential to games, I'm, I embrace it more, embrace the term more, whatever. It's almost like I don't want them, them to be called art because when they're not being taken seriously, you can do whatever you want and, and, and people just kind of expect it. And so I think games provide this unique opportunity to really push creative boundaries and, and, and dream big about big ideas and things like that. So. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Thank you. I'm going to jump in with a question. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you came to? I mean, the pixel art is a very specific thing of 
genre. Right. Um, and I remember reading that you, you didn't start with it. Right? You yeah. Moved into it. Can you talk a little bit about about that process and how you're being out in the landscape kind of made you come to this as the way to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I um I started by painting. I was I was practicing uh, watercolors and acrylics, and painting different landscapes. And a lot of times I wouldn't be painting in the landscapes, but I'd go out and I had a lot of disposable camera pictures that I used as reference. So I'd go out, you know, me and my partner would go kayaking or something, take a bunch of pictures. And I've just taken pictures over the years, and I had a big shoebox of pictures and I would I started uh, illustrating those watercolor and everything else and then once I moved into pixel art all of those pictures became the foundation for all of the scenes in the game yeah I am um, so urban and regional planning is my background. I, I was a GIS developer before this. I didn't really want to get into games. I like, I, I um, not to absolve myself of the responsibility, I just didn't realize what was happening until I published the game. And I was like, wait, I just made a game. And, and I, um, I've been like reconsidering it a little bit, like whether I really want to be doing games. But so it, it was kind of, um, maybe I wasn't like paying enough attention. That's how I got into it, I guess. <laughs> I guess the moral is GIS and you. Like, yeah, 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 don't. <laughs> yeah, close arc map. It's a bad influence. <laughs> Would you say that you have reservations about games as a medium? Yeah, a little bit. I, well, you know, there's, there's nice gamers. There's mean gamers. Um, I don't know if y'all spend a lot of time on Steam. Um, there are a lot of opinionated people on Steam that are not always pleasant to interact with. I didn't find it like it, like what I was trying to do, I didn't think it would be a very welcoming environment and ended up being much more welcoming than I anticipated, which was a relief. But I thought maybe I wouldn't fit into that community very well. So yeah, I was a little, had some reservations there. Mm -hmm. media and different projects. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, aside from following you on Twitter, <laughs> where do you see this, uh, given the reception that particularly in fact, yeah. where do you see this moving Yeah, I'm not sure yet. So I'm, I'm working with uh, this collaborative, you know, Google AI, FM Mora, Jesse Jacoby, Aaron Gray is kind of at the core, and we have other people we're participating with. And we're all just kind of wondering if we should do something next. I was actually thinking, like, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure if I'll do it or not, but maybe just retiring the social and doing something totally different. Um, but, you know, I did, I've been playing around with um, a little interactive thing about the pine woods of eastern Louisiana that takes a slightly different approach to exploring the, the extractive and racialized histories of that region as well. Um, not sure if I'll do it or not, so I'm just doing some self-reflection right now. Yeah. Was Steam always the kind of target audience for the game? I, well, I guess I should back up a little bit. Yeah. Steam is one of multiple audiences for gaming. Yeah. Steam being PC, which I think maybe I understand the kind of reservation about it. Mean gamers, nice games, different kind of. There's the moment the moment you engage with Steam, that's that's an audience. Yeah, yeah. PlayStation, that's an audience. Yep. Nintendo, that's that they're they're different platforms that appeal due to the branding of the companies mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. Appeal to different people. So my question is, was Steam always the kind of target audience for you? You know, I think a, very early on, I. Um, wanted to release it just on this platform itch where it's kind of just lower traffic, it's more informal, it's, I think there's more, a, a bit more experimentation on that platform, so I felt like it would fit in a little better. But then I signed with a publisher, which, which I did that because I was getting more and more involved in developing the game, 
and I was also working full time as a GIS developer, and I was moonlighting as a game dev, and it was really bad for my sleep schedule. And so I just tweeted, um, like I still have the tweet. It was like I tweeted, uh, "Can someone please publish my game?" And then I said, "Help me," or something like that. And uh, <laughs> And Raw Fury, a few publishers reached out, and Raw Fury was one of them. And they provided kind of a path to where I could, you know, I could, it was a modest income, but I could just work on the game full time until I finished it. And a stipulation of that when I signed the contract was like, you release it on Steam, you release it on PlayStation, Xbox, all these things. And I didn't really give that enough thought before I signed the contract, but, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for them. Uh, coming in when they did, but so that's sort of why it's coming out on these platforms, is because I'm legally obligated to release them. <laughs> I think I really appreciate the fact that you kind of went through the, just like how um, this industrial expansion mm -hmm. affected not only cities along the city, but also down to uh, community level, but also on a personal level, mm -hmm. just like how, yeah, families and just like people in general are affected by this. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, like one question I want to ask is how do you think, what do you think you've discovered through developing this experience through a game that you think would, you would have, um, I guess, um, yeah, you wouldn't have like dug up or discover if you want to be the development as yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that question's awesome. Um, well, one thing that, this is a little tangential, but I was for part of it in Central Virginia, so I had to relocate to Central Virginia for a little while, and so I was developing the game in Central Virginia, far from Louisiana, and I was exploring all of these landscapes more intimately in Virginia than I had, you know, even when I was back home. And so that that was that kind of folded into the COVID experience as well a little bit, where there was this weird deterritorialization where my mind was in these communities much more than even where I was physically, you know. Um, so that was, I think, interesting by itself. But as far as how it shed new insight, I mean, one thing I regret about this project, and I think I just if I had more time, I would have structured it differently, which was gotten more community members to participate. That's something that I, I wish I had done. Um, and I think would have provided a lot more insight and I would have learned a lot more about it rather than, you know, a lot of it, to be truthful, I was relying on resources that I'd already explored, that I'd already used. So beyond maintaining an intimate connection to my home while I was away, um, I don't feel like I, I, I learned um, much more than I already had. Yeah. Hey. Cool. Yeah. You you hesitate to call it a game, but you were um, you were also hesitant to call it interactive media. <laughs> yeah. Sounds especially with the community wanting more to be investment, um, and just in the last game yourself, please be a game. I'm sorry. What? Reporting, yeah, yeah, it definitely could have. It could have been, it could have been a website or something else. I think, like in the back of my mind, you know, I had a few conflicting goals and ideas, and it took so long to develop that it's like my priorities would change and shift over time. But like I said, the very beginning was just like, how do you get people interested in this region in an organic way where they just, especially young people, just feel naturally compelled to research it and to look into it. And so I thought. Get games or at least something that was slightly more interactive might be an interesting way of doing that. But then of course I like made this really text heavy inter you know, interactive fiction thing that like is inaccessible to a lot of people too. So I'm not sure, you know, I think it was a little muddy, honestly, my thinking on it. Going back to your use of the Final Fantasy setting as an example. Yeah. I think so for everyone who is <laughs> Part of the kind of beginnings of the Final Fantasy VII mm -hmm. is actually your realization of the kind of exploitation that's going on, and you are 
your, the characters that you're playing as mm -hmm. take up agency in kind of responding to that problem in a form of what could be considered eco terrorism. Mm -hmm. right? um, but I think part of the kind of trickiness of the de definition of, okay, at what point does it transition from the game to uh, kind of just a story that I'm progressing by clicking a button is when you're playing as characters who are experiencing some of the issues that you kind of presented in your game, but their character that they're playing as is has some kind of sense of agency on that situation. Yeah. Right. So I guess part of my desire to help you kind of sort of get you to start to approach the question of is this art, is it a game, is it you know, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like the character that you are Characters that you're observing in the game are do they have a sense of agency on the situations they're observing? Not in a lar not in the largest context. There's some you know there's a lot of interactivity in just the traditional adventure game sense in terms of you get an item, you can unlock an area. One dialogue choice may branch to another, but um, the larger structural aspects of the environment don't change at all. Um, throughout the game. Yeah, so I would say that in the end, your agency is kind of extinguished <laughs> a bit. I'm going to use my prerogative here to ask a question, but one of the things that is possible in this context is to uh, give a sense of how absolutely hilarious some of the dialogue <laughs> is. And like the characters are, they have incredible depth. I'm thinking in particular of the private detective. Who's, yeah, yeah, LeBlanc. It's really, really funny. And, and talks like no one I've ever heard from before. And he's obviously, maybe, maybe he's an amalgam of people that you know. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about how, like, these, you get the sense that these are real people, you know. For, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, well, they, so all of the, LeBlanc included, like, there's a lot of older men in the game, and all of them are an impersonation of my dad. Just <laughs> <laughs> different, you know, different moods, you know. And uh, LeBlanc is, you know, when he's had a few coals lights and he's, you know, wandering around the yard. And, but like, um, so the, yeah, so that's, I think that's where all that came from. And I mean, so it was all drawn from, like you said, uh, amalgamations of, either people I know personally, people I've interacted with, family members, uh, or just regional archetypes when it, you know. Yeah, so the, the game does get really ridiculous, which is, I think, some people love it, some people hate it, but the further along you go and the more surreal it gets, the more a bunch of outlandish stuff happens and the narrative just veers into something absurd and yeah, that, so that's a part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I mean, it's like it's being developed over five years. I knew in a in a vague way I wanted to draw attention to certain aspects of the region I grew up in. Um, and I wanted it to be played by people who would feel impacted by it or compelled to act in some way. That was kind of the original intention. But then at the same time, I had a kind of countervailing feeling of not wanting to make it didactic, not wanting to try to lecture people. And so those were always two feelings I had in conflict. So I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how most artists operate, but I. I'll just be honest, I don't know. Like I, I, you know, my mind changes all the time, like like even day to day. Like I, it's just, I felt compelled to make it. Other people wanted to participate. We built a community around it. And I was meeting people through it who were interesting and good hearted people. And it just felt like a project that I should push forward for unknown reasons. Thank you so much.